Hello and welcome to Intro to Fire. Today we're going to be talking about all that makes the fire standard great, all of the fascinating things you would need to know to get started with the fire standard. I am really excited to take you all through this. Um, a quick bit of housekeeping before we get into anything else. I will mention that this is a free presentation, uh, much like much of the material in the FHIR standard. Uh, this presentation is licensed under the Creative Commons uh, Attribution Share Alike 4.0 International License. Uh, which does, of course, mean that you are welcome to distribute it, you're welcome to give it to friends, you're welcome to send it to colleagues. Um, we in the FIRE community are big, big believers in free and open exchange of material and information and data and all of that good stuff. Uh, and I would be delighted to hear that you shared this with other people if you thought that they would find it useful. Um, all of the material in terms of code we're going to talk about today is licensed, of course, under the Apache software license. Um, so do go ahead and share this stuff. Now, with that out of the way, uh, I will introduce myself. I am James Agnew. I will be your host for the next roughly an hour and a half. Um, I, my day job is as Chief Technology Officer and Head Geek here at Smile CDR. Uh, I'm also the project lead for the Happy Project, which is an open source implementation of a number of HL7 standards, uh, certainly including the Happy Fire Project, uh, which implements today's, uh, today's topic, the Fire Standard. In terms, of, uh, in terms of subject material for today, I'm going to talk a little bit on the background of the FHIR standard, where it comes from, what led to its creation, all of that good stuff. We will spend probably the bulk of our time talking about the, the two middle topics, uh, the data model and the REST APIs, which are really the things you need to know in order to get started with, with the FHIR standard. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit at the end about implementation guides as well, which is certainly a very important a very valuable topic if you're trying to, uh, to implement FHIR today. So before we get into FHIR itself, I think it's useful to understand why it was created in the first place and where it comes from. Uh, the best sort of way to frame that discussion, I find, is to talk about what we'll call ancient history. Uh, I mean, I'm talking here, of course, the year 2000, which isn't that long ago. But of course, depending on your perspective, uh, if you're into IT, I mean, 2000 is... It's, it's a dinosaur era in some ways as far as technology goes, but I, I mean, in other ways, of course, it's uh, as recent as possibly could be. Um, I myself started my career in health informatics roughly the year 2000, so I'm, I'm talking about personal experience when I first started. Um, one, of my, one of the very first projects I ever worked on uh, when I first got into health informatics, sort of not too long after I'd graduated uh, from school, was working on a project that was trying to link data across two different, from two different organizations together. Um, basically linking the data that came from two different hospitals in a little web portal that would aggregate patients' results from those two, uh, those two hospitals. I think in, in, you know, in the modern era, of course, this just seems like child's play, creating a, a, creating a little portal that will show you data from two different places. I mean, that just seems completely trivial. But in the year 2000, it really wasn't. There were all kinds of really basic problems we had to solve in order to make this happen. Getting access to data, designing asynchronous web applications. I mean, these were, these were really crazy problems. Even simple, simple challenges around having a page reload when new data became available. I mean, this, this type of thing, we've all used Gmail in the modern era, and we know that pages are able to update themselves when new data is available. But back then we were dealing with, you know, Internet Explorer 5 and hidden iframes that were constantly reloading and systems that ran out of memory the second you tried to do anything fancy. Uh, it really was an interesting, different time. The technology that we used to sort of sh shuffle data around was an older protocol known as HL7 version 2. Um, and HL7 version 2, which I'm going to show you a sample of in a second, um, is, is, I mean, it, in many ways is a really neat protocol. It's very dense in terms of its information, the amount of information it can convey. Um, once you're used to it, it's really easy to quickly scan it, which is nice. Um, and people who are experts at V2, um, which I guess I would count myself as, can really quickly tell you what's in, what's in a message, what's it trying to tell you, and all of that, that good stuff. But back then, we were, you know, we were trying to design these crazy asynchronous queries that would, uh, 
would connect data from these two systems. I've got a screenshot which I was able to dig up that shows you, I mean, this is a basic prototype of the, the form application that we built a long time ago. Uh, and I, I think it's hilarious for all kinds of reasons. I mean, it, it looks so old fashioned now. Um, and I mean, as I said, this is Internet Explorer 5, which is kind of hilarious in, on, in its own regard. Um, but I mean, at the same time, I'm incredibly, I'm incredibly proud, frankly, of, of what we built here, just because this system was dynamically going out and asynchronously querying a bunch of backend systems using these V2 queries and reloading pages and dynamically updating itself when new data became available. It, it was in many ways kind of a groundbreaking piece of technology. The clinical exchanges that we did to, uh, you know, to make this happen were HL7 V2 payloads. And this, this little blurb at, on the top of this slide is an example of an HL7 V2 message. Uh, they are, as I say, very dense. Uh, they're kind of neat too. I mean, anyone can look at that and understand it. There was a large, a large effort though to replace HL7 V2 with something more modern that happened in the 90s. Um, and that, that led to the creation of a protocol called HL7 version 3. Uh, the red XML payload that you see on the bottom of this slide is an example of, um, of a, a, V3 pro, a V3 payload. Um, HL7 version 3, unfortunately, was an amazing, amazing effort, and there really were some great ideas in it, but it utterly failed to, to attract any kind of mind share. And there's lots of reasons that that's the case, but I mean, probably the biggest was that it, it was so complicated and so difficult to understand and so intense to sort of do anything with that it just, it never really managed to, to take off as a useful standard. Um, and I mean, this, this ultimately leads to this idea that basic technology was quite a barrier in terms of, in terms of sort of achieving interoperability in the health space. Lots of amazing things have been done using HL7 version 2 and HL7 version 3 and all of the other, all of the other protocols, but lots of amazing things were also not done just because the technology hadn't caught up. It, it really wasn't usable by modern approaches to building applications. I mean, especially things like building apps that work on your phone or on a tablet or work across slow distributed mobile networks. There's all kinds of uh, all kinds of barriers there. So I mean all of this leads to where does fire come from? So fire effectively was created as a response to these old technologies as a fresh attempt to build a standard that could meet the modern needs for data and modern needs for interoperability and most importantly would be something that would be picked up by people who needed to build technology uh, to solve healthcare problems. So today's subject of course is fire. That's what we're going to talk about. Um, we should probably start with the acronym, of course. FIRE uh, stands for Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources. Um, and I mean, part of that is, is obvious. You know, the H and the I, we're talking about healthcare interoperability. That is fundamentally what this uh, protocol is for. So no, no question there why we chose those letters. We chose the word fast kind of deliberately, uh, and fast in this context is not intended to convey that we're moving data around really quickly or anything like that. The idea behind saying that this is a fast standard is it's intended to be fast to adopt. And that's a really key distinction. One of the fundamental goals of the FIRE standard is to create a standard that you don't need a PhD in data ontologies, you don't need 18 years of industry experience, like nothing like that is required to be successful with FIRE. It is intended to be a standard that you can pick up, quickly learn, and very quickly become proficient and productive in. Uh, that is a, a fundamental aim of the FIRE standard, and certainly I would say it, it has largely been achieved. Um, the word resources as well is kind of interesting. We're going to talk a whole bunch about uh, about sort of what these resources are and why we chose that. But the, the short version of, of where that comes from, the word resource is actually taken straight out of the, the HTTP specification. So if you've ever used a web browser, and I'm quite certain you have, um, you have probably, I mean, you've certainly used the HTTP spec. That's the protocol that, uh, that moves web pages from servers somewhere in the cloud into your browser. Uh, and the language that they use describes the entire World Wide Web in terms of addressable resources. 
Uh, the simple idea there is that, let's say I want to do a search. So I go to Google's homepage and I type in my query term. Uh, and then I pull down a page with a bunch of, of search results on it. What I've actually done is I have downloaded a resource. That resource in this case is search results. Uh, I might decide that I'm interested in something and I might go to Wikipedia, look up an article or something like that. And ultimately what I'd access at Wikipedia is another resource. It's in that case a, a, a set of information, an article from Wikipedia. Um, the, the HTTP spec describes the entire web in terms of these addressable, fetchable resources. And Fire is sort of taking all of that context and applying it to healthcare. So Fire tries to think about health records as a collection of independent resources that we can download and, make, and do useful things with. Uh, that's, that's sort of the idea behind, behind the acronym and where it all comes from. A little bit on, on nomenclature here. Um, the, the full title for FHIR, in fact, is HL7 FHIR. Um, and just to sort of make sure it's clear here uh, where, you know, where this all comes from, HL7 is a standards development organization. They are the developing body that creates the FHIR standard. And then FHIR is the name of one of their products, um, in this case, the FHIR standard. Uh, HL7 have other product families, things like HL7 version 2 and HL7 CDA. Uh, and in fact, they have a whole other suite of product families that exist out there. Although these days, certainly Fire is the most, uh, most popular of all of them. Also worth mentioning, in case you're sort of curious about HL7, the organization, uh, I said that HL7, the organization, created Fire. And to sort of put a little bit more context into that, HL7, the standards development organization, is actually just they're a fairly tiny organization who sort of administer the creation of standards. Uh, they're based in Michigan, uh, not too far from where we're based at Smile CDR. We're a, a, maybe a five, six hour drive away from, from their headquarters. Um, but almost none of the actual work of standards development happens by HL7, the corporate entity. What HL7 bring to the table is a process and a governance framework, and they organize events. Uh, the HL7 FHIR standard is created by volunteers uh, who are spread entirely around the world. People from all corners of the globe who are members of the HL7 community have created this standard. Uh, and have agreed to sort of give it away for free, which is honestly an amazing thing. So there we go. So what is FHIR? Uh, if you take nothing else away from this presentation, I'd say this is, this is the key slide. Uh, if you want to understand ultimately what is, when we say FHIR, what are we talking about? So the first thing that FHIR is, is this really nice and really robust data model that we can use to describe almost anything that's in there, out there as far as healthcare data goes. Um, and I'm going to spend lots of time talking about how that data model works and what it is and all of that good stuff. Um, point two, uh, Fire is a RESTful API for, for interacting with and exchanging and moving data around. Uh, if you're not familiar with the concept of a RESTful API, and I'm sure many people are, but if you're not, uh, a RESTful API in this context is basically sort of an exchange mechanism. It's a way for system A to request data from system B or to send data to system B or whatever the case may be. Um, so many, many sort of healthcare standards that are out there, and there are many of them, they will often sort of be those first two things. There'll be some sort of data model, there'll be some sort of transport specification, uh, and they'll generally leave things at that. That, that is typically the, the sort of boundary, the box that we would drive or we would draw around uh, a healthcare interoperability standard. One of the things that makes FHIR really special is the fact that it goes well beyond being just those two things, and it extends to a few other areas. That I'll talk about next. Um, the third thing that FHIR is, and this is core to FHIR's existence, is FHIR is a collection of amazing open source tools that you can use to help you implement the FHIR specification in your own applications. Uh, of course, here at Smile CDR, we are the creators and maintainers of the Happy FHIR library, which is a reference implementation of the FHIR standard for the Java programming language. And we certainly recommend, if you're a Java programmer, uh, 
uh, we certainly recommend that you use that library to, to implement Fire in your applications. It is free, it is open source, uh, it's licensed under the Apache 2 license, so it is extremely open and accessible and commercial friendly and all of that good stuff. But if you're not a Java programmer, uh, there are open source libraries of excellent quality in all kinds of other languages as well. Uh, the support for open source in Fire extends to .NET, to JavaScript, to Perl, to Ruby, to PHP. Uh, there are Go libraries being created, Swift libraries. Um, I have seen Delphi libraries. So, and I mean, the list goes on and on. Uh, there are so many really astoundingly good uh, open source libraries out there for working with Fire. Uh, that it 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 really is. It's a great ecosystem for 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 getting started. Really, the fourth thing that Fire is uh, fundamentally is this this sort of network of Fire servers that are available. And what I mean by that is increasingly people are adopting Fire as the mechanism that, that you can use to request data from them. Uh, EHR vendors are doing this. Governments are doing this around the world. Uh, organizations, universities, hospitals, every, every organization that turns around and also decides to implement the same standard means there's one more place you can get data with an expectation that even if the data models aren't exactly the same, you will have a similar base understanding and a similar protocol to speak and all of that good stuff. Um, which really, as Fire continues to be adopted, becomes a more and more valuable uh, resource in terms, of, in terms of being able to build interoperable solutions. Finally, and honestly most importantly in this entire list, is Fire is this astoundingly great community of implementers. Uh, Fire truly is a global standard. It has activity 24-7 around the world. There are just some amazing resources that you can use to, to interact with other developers, and it is a, a really very supportive community. Um, a lot of this is centered around a website that I think I'll talk about a little bit later called chat.fire.org. Uh, if you've never been to chat.fire.org, it is a free 24-7 chat platform where there is always somebody online discussing some part of the Fire standard, answering questions, uh, you know, coming up with ideas, making proposals. It is, it is a really, really great sort of resource. So certainly I would say take advantage of chat.fire.org. In terms of uh, what makes Fire different, uh, I was saying that I, I, sp I spoke at the start about a couple of standards that came before Fire. And one of the primary aims of Fire was to not re repeat the mistakes of the past. Um, and a lot of that sort of led to the creation of this thing called the Fire Manifesto, which was a set of guiding principles that, especially in the early days of the creation of Fire, were really key in terms of decision making in order to try and achieve a standard that could be implemented quickly, as I was saying with that, uh, that fast word at the start. Um, the Fire Manifesto had a couple of, had actually quite a few points, and I'm not going to talk about all of them, but there are a few high points that I want to touch on before we get into the real nitty gritty of what the Fire standard is. The first point on the Fire Manifesto is this implementer focus. And this is, this is really important. Uh, the Fire spec is targeted very specifically at the people who will ultimately be building healthcare solutions. In other words, the developers, the implementer community. Um, that, that may, and I mean, I, I feel like when I say that, it, it almost seems like it should be self-explanatory. If you're writing a, a technical standard, of course, you're targeting software developers. But it, it doesn't always pan out that way. Um, many of the earlier standards that are out there, and frankly, many of the standards that exist today in the healthcare interoperability landscape, have been written by people who have extensive clinical backgrounds, um, you know, who are clinicians, who are doctors, who are, you know, those, those prototypical PhDs in data ontology. And I mean, of course, there's nothing wrong with those disciplines, but these types of people certainly have different vocabulary in terms of how they label things and how they think about the world. And it's not totally compatible all the time with people who have studied, you know, traditional technical disciplines like computer science. So the FIRE standard has gone to great lengths, actually, and, and put a lot of effort into making sure that the way we label things, the way that we interact with the standard, the vocabulary we use, should be something that's comfortable for developers, even if that means shying away from terms that are 
sort of more preferred in the clinical sense. It's an interesting balance, and it's not always one that's easy to come by, but it is something that FIRE has tried really hard to stay with, um, and that's important. The other half of the implementer focus is this notion that the standard needs to actually be implementable. Again, that sort of sounds like it should be, like it should be self-evident that a standard should be implementable, but when you're writing standards, it is really difficult to, to to make sure something is implementable. You might think you have the optimal design for something, and then when someone tries to implement it, um, you know, it, it turns out that what you've come up with was completely unworkable. And of course, in the world of standards, that's a really complicated problem because standards are, they're not just simple specifications that you release and constantly iterate on. Uh, a standard has a formal life cycle, it has a balloting process behind it, it needs to be stamped and normative at some point. Uh, it needs, yeah, and then it can't be changed once it's been made normative. And doing that is really difficult. So it is important when you're developing a standard to make sure that it is well tested before it is stamped as being final. So a big part of the FIRE process is, is early and constant testing of, of the standard at these events called FIRE Connectathons. I've got a little screenshot on, the, on this slide of a FIRE Connectathon event. Um, these connectathons pre-pandemic were often held in, in, in hotel basements in various cities around the world. Um, they have since moved to being online, and it's looking like for all, most, if not all, of 2021, they'll probably continue to be virtual events. And they work surprisingly well as virtual events as well. Uh, the bottom line is, it is critical to the standards development process to get people either, you know, in the same room, whether that room is physical or virtual, talking to each other, trying out ideas, proving that things work, rejecting things that don't work. This is all absolutely key to the, uh, the design of FIRE. Um, another, another key point to the, uh, the FIRE Manifesto is a focus on common scenarios. One of the, the sort of key lessons we learned in the HL7 v v3 protocol was as follows. Version 3 tried to be comprehensive, which of course is a noble goal. It, it tried to make sure that it was designing a standard that was usable for everybody's use cases. And of course, the challenge when you build a standard that covers every single use case is that you end up with a standard that is full of all kinds of things that are only useful to the one person that needed it. Uh, and ultimately what you end up with is a massively bloated sort of piece of specification that's really difficult to read because it covers just so much useless ground. Um, Fire has tried to not repeat that mistake. So it has this real, really, really significant emphasis on what FIRE calls the 80-20 rule. And to FIRE, the 80-20 rule works as follows. Um, things that go into the FIRE standard will not be accepted into the core specification unless they would be usable and useful and used by 80% of systems around the world. Now, of course, there's no formal way of figuring that out. It would be impossible to survey every system developer in the entire world to figure out if 80% of people are going to use an element you are thinking about adding. So it, there is there's absolutely sort of a subjective element to this, but it is a regular discussion in, in the development of the FIRE standard. Are we adding things that don't conform to the 80-20 rule? Uh, the, the usual example that I like to give here is if I was building a system for ophthalmology reasons, uh, I might be interested in tracking the patient's eye color. Um, I, I have no idea, honestly, if that is a thing that's tracked in ophthalmology systems, but let's say for the sake of argument it is. Um, I, I might sort of propose to the FIRE standard, you know, you should add an attribute for eye color because that is super important to me. And the response that I would absolutely expect to get back is that 80% of systems around the world do not care about eye color. That's just not a common attribute for electronic medical record systems to want to track. So I would fully expect that that request would get rejected. Eye color is not going to end up in the core specification of FIRE. Now, the other half of the 80-20 rule is the remaining 20%. And the idea with that 20 is that FIRE provides an easy to use extension framework, which means that whatever you need to collect that is not a part of the 80%, there's an easy way for you to add it in. So FIRE's got this really nice extension mechanism where in my fictitious ophthalmology example, if I want to track eye color, all I need to do is add an extension and there we go. I've got a, a mechanism for collecting that. It's very important to sort of realize uh, extensions are 
they're fundamental to the design of fire. Um, the the 20% is not sort of, it's not there as a concession. It's not there to use if you really have to or anything like that. The expectation with fire is that any implementation of any sort of real complexity is almost certain to have its own 20% where they're going to have a collection of extensions that are useful for whatever use case is trying to be solved. So it is any any real implementation, and I've been through many of them, they always have their 80% and their 20%, and that is a normal part of software development as, fire, as far as the fire standard goes. Um, two more points to talk through. This one is critical. Fire is open. It is open like crazy. Um, what I mean by that, of course, fire is, as I said at the start, um, full of open material, just like this presentation. But the fire spec itself is licensed under the Creative Commons CC0 license, which is one of the least restrictive CC licenses you can come up with. This is really important because it does mean that you can use fire in your applications for free no matter what. This extends certainly, of course, to if you're building open source, but it does absolutely include you know, building proprietary software, including software you intend to sell. So just to really drive that point home, if you are building your own EMR, for example, you can use Fire, you can build Fire into your application, you can use the open source libraries, you can use the Fire methodology, and you can do all of this without needing to pay anyone. Uh, there is no requirement to, you know, to join HL7 or to pay royalty fees or anything like that. It is very much an open, uh, an open standard. There is, I mean, HL7 itself does have membership. You can, you can, you, you do have to pay to sort of join the HL7 organization itself. And if you want to vote on the standard, uh, you do need to pay to join, uh, join that. But using using Fire d does not require you to uh, to have that membership, and that is sort of an important point to all of this. And the final point around the Fire Manifesto, before we really dive into the more important stuff around what is Fire, is this point, which I think I've mentioned a few times already, which is that Fire should be easy to adopt. In other words, the F, it should be fast. Um, you know, this is being sort of simple and, and quick to get up and running is it really is has been critical for the adoption of fire. And as I say on this slide, I have witnessed uh, organizations go from zero to 100 in weeks, um, meaning that often I've seen an organization with capable developers who are great at what they do, but have never heard of fire. And within a matter of weeks, they have gotten up and running and have had software that was production ready, um, you know, that, that can happen really quickly because it is a very easy standard to learn. So um, we're going to dive into the FHIR standard next. We're going to talk a bunch about the various things that make FHIR what it is. This is where things, I think, really get interesting. So I was saying at the start, we use the, the letter R stands for resources. And resource, of course, is that HTTP sort of concept of resource. In the world of Fire, an individual resource is a data model for some specific purpose. I've got a few examples here um, that are that are you know listed. So you know if we need to model if we're building a healthcare application, the kind of hello world of healthcare applications is we're going to model our patients. Every healthcare application probably has a patient, and there is a patient resource, and that what that is is a collection of attributes, and I'll certainly show it to you shortly. Um, that we have decided are a part of the standard data model to model patients. Uh, in fire. We've got encounters, which of course are things like hospital visits and, and trips to you to visit your family doctor or whatever it is. We've got observations and diagnostic reports. Uh, we've got medications and it, it, it goes on and on. Fire's list of resources goes in every possible direction. This is your first view of the actual fire spec. This is taken from hl7.org slash fire slash patient.html, which is the URL that you would take to get yourself right to the patient resource model. Uh, there's a few things that I like to point out about this page. I mean, first off, it is nicely laid out and easy to look at. And of course, this is one of those things that 
I mean, seems like it should be obvious, but to anyone who's got long-standing experience dealing with previous health standards, things like HL7 version 2 and HL7 version 3, the standard being readable and being sort of presented in a nice publicly accessible website is not something you can actually take for granted. The second thing that I love about the fire specification is all those little blue links that are all over it. Of course, my plan here isn't to teach you how the web works. We're all used to using websites like Wikipedia. But the really nice thing about specifically the fire spec and the way that it works is if there's a concept anywhere on the page that you're interested in, you can hover over it, get more details with your mouse, you can even click on it and, and learn all about that thing. When I bring this page up for the first time for people to look at, often their eyes are drawn to that little sigma symbol that exists uh, in, the, in the flags column. And you may be wondering what that is. I'm actually not going to tell you right now what that sigma is all about, but I will use it to prove a point, which is that you yourself, uh, when you're done watching this, you are welcome to go to the fire spec, go and have a look at that sigma symbol, hover your mouse over it, and what it's going to say to you is summary, which doesn't really tell you exactly what that is, but just like everything else in the spec, if you click on it, you'll be taken to a full definition of what a resource summary view is, and that goes for everything here. If you want to know how a data type works, you can click on it. If you want to know the definition for a field, you can click on that. The entire spec is designed to be readable in, in just a really nice way. The other thing worth pointing out while we talk about the way the model is designed is that it is really designed with software developers in mind. All of the language we use, all of the sort of ways that we lay out information and the way that we describe concepts in the FHIR specification are written not with the end clinical users in mind, so they're not written necessarily with the doctors and the nurses and the people providing care in mind, but rather they're written with the people who are going to be developing software software in mind. This too may just seem like an obvious thing to do, but you do need to realize that health standards have not always worked this way. Health standards traditionally are written by people who are experts in the domain of healthcare data modeling. Um, and FHIR has tried to do this differently. So this is, despite seeming like an obvious thing to do, this is really is a different approach. So here we go. This is a link to the, the root of the FHIR spec. hl7.org slash FHIR will take you there. Um, when I'm doing live demonstrations of this, one of the things I like to do is sort of slide through this and show a few, a few key links. Working from slides, the thing that I really want to point out, there's one link that's more important than anything else on this homepage, and it's a little bit buried in that red toolbar up at the top. Uh, the word resources uh, is probably the single most important part of the entire fire spec. If you click on the word resources on that page, it will take you to a comprehensive list of every single fire resource there is, and you can pretty much get anywhere else in the spec by, uh, by navigating through the various pages that are in there. So much like any programming language that you've ever used, FHIR has defined a set of data types. And anyone who's a programmer, many of these data types are going to seem pretty intuitive. Perhaps not all of them, but a bunch of them will. Just like every programming language out there, FHIR has concepts like strings and booleans and dates and decimal numbers and integer numbers, that type of thing. There's a couple of, uh, of more unusual data types, though. URI is a great example of that. Uh, naturally, throughout the FHIR model, uh, we tend to use URIs and URLs quite a bit. It's to the point where they get their own dedicated data type. Uh, the next one on the, on the slide is an example. There's actually a typo there. That should say base64. Um, we use base64 encoded data quite a bit in the FHIR spec. Base64 is a mechanism for putting binary data, for encoding binary data into a textual payload. And of course, that's exactly what the FHIR spec is, is a textual payload that sometimes needs to represent a little bit of binary data. Uh, a nice example of that, for, uh, for example, would be the patient resource, which optionally can include a photo of the patient. And we would do that with a little, a little blob of base64 data that includes that patient information in there. There are two data, data types that are sort of paramount uh, when you think about modeling healthcare data, and they're for representing the concepts of dates and times. Naturally, if you think about what a health record fundamentally is, of course, health records at their core are just a series of, at this time this happened, at this other time this other thing happened. Ultimately, that's the most important thing that we're ever documenting when we, uh, when we capture 
electronic data and health records. So it makes sense we would spend a bunch of time thinking about our dates and our times. Fire has got two separate uh, data types that are used to represent this concept, and they, they differ slightly in subtle ways, so I want to spend a bit of time talking about the distinction here. The first is the data type that's actually just called date, date time. Date time is for representing what we call human times. A human time, which is a bit of a strange term, uh, is fundamentally intended to model things, times that came from a human. So for example, uh, if Dr. Bob has said, James is going to take Tylenol tomorrow at 1 p.m. Fundamentally, that's a time that came from a human. Dr. Bob is saying that I should do this tomorrow at 1. He's not saying I should do this at precisely 1 o'clock with 0 seconds and 0 milliseconds. He's using as much precision in, in this order as he wished to use. And to that end, the, the date time is a data type that is of variable precision, meaning that it could, it could capture just a year, it could capture a year and a month, it could capture a year, month, day. Uh, it might optionally include a time with just hours and minutes. It might include seconds. It might even go as far as milliseconds if someone wanted to capture all of that. Um, the most important point to realize here is that the date time is, is this sliding scale of precision that can capture every level of precision. This is one of these little challenges. If you're trying to develop applications using Fire, I will say that dealing with date times is one of the one of the bigger pain in the butt sort of parts of dealing with fire. Certainly if you're trying to author fire content, it's great because it means whatever level of precision you have asked an end user for, you can just put that into the fire resource. That part's easy. The hard part is dealing with variable precision when you're trying to consume other people's fire data. Uh, and this is, it's something I certainly will not sugarcoat. Um, trying to build any kind of UI that deals with variable precision dates and times is a bit of a nuisance. Uh, there's no other way around that. The other data type that we have for representing these is called the instant data type. An instant is for system times. In other words, any timestamp that was captured by a computer. And we make an assumption in Fire that if the system is capturing the timestamp, it's able to get at least the second, if not to the millisecond of precision. So it's got a fairly high level of precision uh, built into it. Uh, these are used for things like timestamps. If, if the computer has captured that, such as event X happened at exactly 32 minutes past the hour um, and 16 milliseconds or something like that. We'll use an instant type to, to capture that information. The format that we use when we're representing these uses a, it's a format called ISO 8601, which is often used these days in other internet standards, so it's probably not new to you. You'll recognize it as the format that goes a year, dash month, dash day, the letter T, and then a 24 hour clock, hours, minutes, seconds, optionally dots with, uh, with milliseconds. I will stress the time zone is absolutely mandatory anytime you're representing a time with either of these data types, and we do this for really good reason. Uh, this is one of these things that people often sort of figure, you know, I'm writing software that's only ever going to get used in a single city, for example, so it's never going to get used across time zone boundaries, so why do I care about capturing time zones? And I don't want to spend too much time belaboring this point, but it is important to realize there are situations, even within a single city, where events like daylight savings time can cause serious miscalculations in time-critical applications. There is, there is actually a pretty big safety concern uh, representing times without understanding the offset that goes with it, so I will say very important to capture that specific piece of information. All of the, the data types I just showed you are what's called the primitive data types. Uh, and primitive data types, of course, you know, they're, they're pretty intuitive to anyone who's dealt with programming languages of any type, whether, whether your programming language of choice is Java, JavaScript, Ruby, anything else. You've probably seen most of the, these data types in some form. Fire, of course, though, is not a programming language, but rather a data representation standard. So it takes the concept of data types a little bit farther and introduces this notion of what we call general purpose data types. Uh, general purpose data types to anyone who is used to previous standards, things like HL7 version 2 and HL7 version 3, these are what you would have known as composite data types in, in those worlds. And if I'm honest, I still kind of call them composite data types. It feels to me like a better term for them, but what can I do about that? A uh, general purpose data type is a little mini structure that is 
for some sort of group of related concepts that's going to get used in multiple parts of the fire specification. So a simple example of that, of course, is the concept of a human name. So what is a human name? It's a family name and maybe a middle name and a given name. And naturally, there's a few different data models within the fire spec that need to deal with these names. Of course, we have our patients. There's things like practitioners. There's things like related persons. All of these have a concept of names. So we've taken all of the, all of the fields that, that encapsulate a name, and we've put them into a little structure called the human name general purpose data type that we reuse across a whole bunch of different parts of the fire spec. Uh, there are a whole collection of these things within the fire spec. I've got a few examples of them uh, shown on the diagram on this slide, but even better, let's jump into an example of, of one of these. So we've got, um, what I'm showing you now is an example of a, of a general purpose data type. And this, of course, is the human name data type. Uh, human names, naturally, uh, we use, as you can see on the screen, this includes things like family name and given name, as you would probably expect in terms of modeling names. But we've also got prefixes and suffixes where you could store things like MD, if someone had that as a suffix, or Mr. or Mrs. or... Uh, junior, any of those things. We've got a period of validity which we might choose to use if we were trying to represent that this is a name that was only valid until a certain date or something like that. Uh, we've got this thing called a use code, uh, and a use code is a means of stating that this name is, is a nickname or an informal name or something like that or a maiden name. Um, so we've got a bunch of parts to this. Uh, to this. This is probably a good time to talk about the concept of cardinality as well. Um, you'll notice the third column states that some of these fields say that they are 0 dot dot 1 and others state that they are 0 dot dot star. Uh, of course, and you can probably guess, uh, the 0 dot dot 1 means that you can have between 0 and 1, so this is an optional field. And then the 0 dot dot star means that it's optional, but also the maximum is unlimited, meaning that you know, while we can have either no, no family name or one family name, we can't have two family names, uh, but we can have multiple given names if we want to. So there's a, an example of using cardinality uh, in all of this. So we're about to get into the part where we, uh, we actually look at an example of a resource. And before we get there, I want to talk a little bit about the things that make up an actual instance of a resource. So what are the parts of a resource when we serialize it and send it over the wire from system A to system B? Um, the first section of a resource is what we call the metadata of that resource. Uh, and metadata includes some fairly obvious things. I mean, every resource has an ID, which is probably fairly obvious. Uh, Fire does support versioning of resources, so we might have this thing called a version ID, which states that this is the second version or the fourth version or the millionth version of a resource, if this is a thing that's changed a bunch. But there's also a whole bunch of other pieces of metadata that are all optional, but have their own useful things, have their own useful purposes. Um, fire resources can have <clears throat> what are called tags, uh, and tags, I mean, if you've ever used tags on, on websites anywhere, you'll be familiar with the concept of tagging. Fire has its own spin on this notion of tagging resources, and these are used for really some kind of interesting use cases. Uh, we've got what are called profile declarations, and I'm going to spend a bunch of time talking about profiles when we get to uh, the implementation guides towards the end, but we've got those as well. And there's also a, a bunch of other sort of pieces of metadata that you'll also you'll often find at the, the top of a resource. The next thing you'll find is your extensions. And extensions, of course, are any bit of information that doesn't fit into the 80%. Um, you'll recall I was talking about that 80-20 rule. Uh, and I'm going to show you in just a moment what an extension looks like so we can actually see how that works. The third thing that we're going to see inside a resource is this thing called a narrative. Um, and narratives are, they really are a very interesting concept. Um, I, I spoke really briefly at the start about CDA, the CDA standard, which was one of the precursor standards that came before the fire standard. Um, CDA was a really interesting standard, and we learned a great deal from, from what worked and what didn't work when we created that standard. One of the most important things we learned from the successes of CDA was this concept that if you're trying to build a data model and send it sort of to arbitrary consumers where you don't necessarily know who the consumer is or what software they're using or anything like that, 
one of the things we can do to ensure, or really at least try to ensure that we've got interoperable software, is to include a human readable version of the, of the structured data that we're sending. Uh, and that's the, that in Fire is this thing called the narrative. Fundamentally, the narrative is a little, and we use HTML for this, it's a little HTML encoded textual version of the, of the content that's in the structured body of the resource. Uh, and this is great because it does mean that if we send data to uh, some new system, even if that system doesn't understand the structured data, if it can't do anything with it but show the narrative to a human, and that human can make a treatment decision or interpretation or something based on that narrative, then we've at least got some base level of interoperability. So narratives are great for that. Uh, I will say in the real world, I mean, narratives are not always used. Not every fire resource has a narrative. Uh, and certainly I've seen many systems that have no use for narratives or did not want to take the time to generate them because they are a bit of a pain to generate. Um, but they are a good thing for interoperability, so I certainly want to encourage their use uh, when possible. The final thing in a FHIR resource, of course, is the resource body, uh, and we'll see an example of that in just a moment. The resource body, of course, is the actual structured data, which is the main purpose for FHIR. FHIR has defined, as of today, three encodings, uh, three means of, of serializing data and sending it across the wire. Uh, the first and most, really most widely implemented is the JSON format. And certainly, as far as internet standards go, um, you absolutely will find JSON being the most commonly used standard out there. Uh, it is important to mention that none of these standards is preferred by FHIR. These are all top-level encodings. They all receive just as much love and just as much care as the others. Um, but realistically, I, I don't have numbers to back this up, but I, I would suspect if you polled every FHIR developer around the world, probably 90% of them, if not more, are using JSON, um, and that's what it is. Uh, XML, of course, does remain popular, um, does get used a fair bit as well. Uh, a third standard called Turtle, which is an RDF specification, uh, does exist within FHIR. It certainly is not nearly used as, as often as the first two, but there are, there are people often involved in clinical research who are really into the concept of RDF, uh, and these people tend to use Turtle, um, and they, they tend to love that encoding. It's actually not an area I know a whole lot about personally, so I can't spend much time talking about it. So let's dive into a real resource. This is our first look. Um, what you're looking at, of course, is what's called an observation resource. Uh, observation is one of those, it's another hello world resource, uh, just like patient, in that if you're building any kind of real clinical system, there is a very good chance you're going to end up using observations. Not quite as frequently as patient, but it is absolutely very common. So I was talking about those four parts of a resource. Where do they live? Uh, you'll notice the metadata uh, sits at the top. You can see there's an ID, there's a version ID. Uh, there's no tags or profile declarations in this specific resource, but they would often go up at the top as well. The next section you can see is, it, is, it, is one example of an extension. Um, and this, this example, which as you can probably guess by looking at it, is a, a glucose reading. So this is a, uh, a resource that would often be taken in the context of diabetes care. So in the context of diabetes care, um, oftentimes when you do tests, you care about what's called the meal context. Uh, and the meal context is sort of this indication that this reading was taken just before breakfast or just after dinner or whatever the case may be. Uh, for, all, for most lab tests, that's really not a useful piece of information. And certainly the meal context doesn't fall into the 80% for lab tests. But if you're working in the realm of diabetes care, uh, meal context is critical, actually. So that's a great example of an 80-20 de de definition. Um, this example here is, is describing that this is a breakfast reading. And as you can see, and this is kind of important to mention, um, the, the way extensions work is they, they work as a little key value pair where your key is a URL of some sort and the value is any data type you want. So in this case, we've chosen a code data type and you can see that it's just a little string breakfast. Um, one of the really nice things about the use of URLs, uh, in fact, there's a couple of reasons we chose to use URLs as those keys in, those, in that, that key value pair. Um, you know, first off, the, the URL is, I mean, it's, it's readable, which is great. Um, you know, even if I don't intend to try and resolve that URL, I can look at it and I can often just guess at what information it's trying to convey. I mean, the fact that it says readings and then ends with the word context, you know, uh, that doesn't 
exactly scream uh, intuitive to people who don't know anything about diabetes care. But to anyone who was building a diabetes app, they would look at that, the word context, and they would instantly know what that refers to. So you get a little bit of readability out of that URL. And then most importantly, the intent with the fire spec is that I should be able to take that URL and punch it into a browser and go and actually learn more about that extension, find out it, find its definition, find out what that extension is used for. And this is really useful because it does mean that if you receive a, a resource from some unknown third-party system and it's got extensions you don't understand, you should be able to take those URLs and go and discover what are the, like what are those extensions? What are they used for? Um, I will stress, this is a fictitious example. This specific URL I made up, so it's not actually going to work, but in the real world, that I would expect that that would happen. Uh, the narrative, which is the next section, as you can see, is a little, uh, a little HTML representation. Um, and actually, there's, I, I would say it's worth pointing out, there's kind of a mistake in this narrative, and I, I leave it there because I like to use it as an example. Uh, the narrative should, should include um, all of the information that would you would need to know in order to be able to uh, in order to be able to use this resource and use it safely uh, and naturally i mean in the context of diabetes care you really do need to know the meal context so i think in order for this to be a completely valid narrative actually it should probably say breakfast fasting glucose of 11.2 milligrams per deciliter but I mean, let's uh, let's ignore the mistake for a second. You'll notice it's a little HTML block. You can use basic tags in there. We've got a bold tag around the uh, the, the the actual number part, which is nice. Um, and most HTML is allowed in here. Uh, in fact, what's allowed is basically the entire X HTML standard, with a couple of exceptions, though. Um, no, no scripting is allowed in the HTML in the narrative, so you can't add the script tag. Uh, or the on click tag or any of those. Uh, you can't add CSS for that matter, so no style tags or anything like that. Uh, so there's a couple of rules that are there for sort of basic safety and interoperability and security reasons. But essentially, other than that, you can do anything you can do in HTML, which is nice. And then finally at the bottom, we've got your structured data. Um, and one of the things that I think is really nice about Fire is that you know, even if even if it doesn't completely make instant sense to you, uh, I do find the resources tend to be quite readable. I think it's even to someone who's not an expert in Fire, it's fairly easy to look at the, the clinical data that's presented on the screen right now and and roughly understand what it's trying to convey, which is nice. So that's the JSON encoding. Let's jump into XML for a second. So this is the this is the equivalent payload in XML, and all of the same information is there represented as XML. Um, and I mean, there are a couple of nuances in terms of things being slightly different. Uh, we've got this value attribute that doesn't exist in, in JSON, but by and large, the element names are the same, the, the order is the same, the structure is the same. So things are, are fairly similar in XML to how they were in, in the JSON version. Um, before we move off of, of the model, there's a couple of concepts I want to go through because these are sort of key concepts in terms of, uh, in terms of understanding how to work with the standard. The first is the concept of identifiers. So naturally, when you're dealing with healthcare, you, you just can't get away from identifiers. Everything has identifiers. You know, our patients have identifiers, like James, the patient. I've probably got a health card number. I've got insurance numbers. Technically, I've got driver's license numbers and passport. Well, I've got one passport number and one driver's license number, hopefully. Um, you know, I, I might have multiple insurance cards with their own different numbers on them. So there's all kinds of identifiers that we care about. Every healthcare facility I've ever visited has probably issued me a medical record number as well. So there are all kinds of identifiers about James the patient. Probably, actually, I've probably got about 10 different identifiers that are scattered across various health record systems. So whenever we represent identifiers in fire and this goes well beyond identifying patients uh, you know it goes into identifying devices and organizations and, and specimens and all kinds of things but let's let's run with the patient example for now um, whenever we identify anything we always do that by using the identifier data type and the identifier data type has two key parts to it it's got a system which identifies what is the namespace like where what what kind of identifier is this and where is it drawn from? And then we've got a value, which is the actual identifier. For these system URIs, um, we use, or for the system, we use a URI once again. 
And much like I was showing you with those extensions, uh, we do this because partly they're readable uh, and partly they're, they're addressable, which is a really nice thing. So what I've got here is an example for a, a Canadian uh, Ontario OHIP number. And an OHIP number is effectively the, the insurance number that is assigned to a patient here in Ontario where I'm based. Um, so this system, I mean, it's, it's nice. I can kind of look at it and I see who issues it. I, I can kind of guess a little bit if you sort of understand the terminology on here that this is a Canada, Ontario patient health card number. Uh, so there's a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of useful stuff on here. And then we've got a value that comes right after that, uh, which is the actual, the actual value, the, the actual identifier. Um, so moving on from identifiers, we often in healthcare codify things as well. Uh, so if I've got a lab test, for example, I, of course, I'm going to want to represent what kind of lab test it is. Uh, and there are thousands, tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of kinds of lab tests that get, that, uh, get performed. Uh, naturally, if we want systems to understand each other, if we want true semantic interoper interoperability, then we want some sort of machine processable identifiers to identify what types of tests we're performing. Um, and that we do with terminology. We do this with reusable sets of codes that hopefully we can agree on so that the same code is used by the person creating the data. Um, and, you know, and the person receiving that data will also understand those codes. Anything that's coded in Fire um, will generally sort of follow this pattern of having a system, which once again uses a URI. Uh, and my example on the screen is for a LOINC code. Uh, LOINC is a set of, of codes that are used to identify lab tests and things related to lab tests. Um, we'll have a system with a URI, then we'll have a code, and that's the actual code. Um, Oftentimes in clinical vocabulary, the codes are very much by design, sort of meaningless numbers. Uh, and I don't want to go into the theory behind that right now, but there are reasons people choose to do that. So in this case, we've got this code 718-7, uh, which of course is, I mean, it doesn't mean anything to you unless you've memorized LOINC, which very few people have. Um, and we will often include a human display name as well, just so that there is something that a human would understand in there. So in this case, what we can actually see with this example is that uh, code 718-7 is in fact the like code for hemoglobin uh, as measured by mass over volume in blood. Um, so that is, that is, that's an example of a like code. So that's codes. And then finally extensions, and you'll hopefully start to notice a pattern here in terms of how often we use these URLs. Um, extensions, once again, uh, are going to use, they're effectively what an extension is, is a set of key value pairs. One ex an extension is a key value pair. A resource can have multiple extensions, um, which would be a collection of key value pairs. And the key in that case is a URL, and then the value is some sort of data type. Uh, it's worth mentioning, um, you can have multiple, multiple extensions with the same URL. So, I mean, with the example of birth time, which I've got up on the screen, of course, it doesn't make sense to, for there to be multiple because it's rare that somebody is born more than once. So you probably wouldn't have multiple birth times. But, um, I mean, if we take my eye color example, I mean, there are people with two different colors of eyes. So it would be reasonable, actually, for you to have Two, uh, two extensions where they both had the same URL that was whatever URL I'd chosen for eye color, but a different value indicating the two different eye colors. That is a, I don't know, not super common, but it is absolutely a thing we can do with extensions. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that, you know, the, the basic example of an extension is a key value pair where the value is a data, data type, but extensions, instead of having a data type as their child, can also have more extensions. Uh, which are effectively called nested extensions. Uh, the example I've got up on the screen now is, um, this is drawn out of uh, what's called the US Core Implementation Guide, which I will talk about a little bit at the end. Uh, I won't spend too much time on it right now, other than to say that in the context of US healthcare, oftentimes we will cast, capture race and ethnicity information on our patients. Um, and the race, uh, the US Core Implementation Guide has defined this extension for capturing race. Uh, and race has two children. Actually, it's got more than that, but I'm showing two of them here. It's got what's called an OMB category, uh, and then it's got a detailed, and those are used to store, to represent a high level category and a more detailed code um, to do with the race of the patient that we're talking about. 
Um, next concept worth talking about is this idea of resource URLs. And I've got a simple example, and this is, this is a real example. You could take this URL and put it into your browser and you will be taken to an actual resource. Um, you will note um, resource URLs always work as follows. They always start with a base URL and the base URL defines where where the server lives. Um, and every Fire URL will build on that base URL somehow. Um, one of the conventions with our servers, with the Happy Fire and Smile CDR servers, is that we will often uh, have the base URL end with the string base followed by the version of Fire. This is a convention in Happy Fire and nothing more, so there's no requirement uh, in the Fire standard that you create your base URL that way, but you will often see Fire, Happy Fire users do that. Um, the next part is the resource type. So a patient resource is going to have slash patient uh, in its URL. An observation resource will have slash observation and so on and so forth. And then finally, we'll have an ID. Now those IDs, I mean, in the real world, oftentimes they will be numbers. They might be sequentially generated. Um, they might be GUIDs. That's another common scheme. Um, but really they can be any combination of letters, numbers, and dots uh, between one and 64 letters long. Those are the rules around IDs. So the word example, while I, th I think it would be rare in a production system to have a word as a resource ID, um, it, is, it is technically valid. And there are, I can think of a handful of, of examples of where that might get used in the real world even. So that's, uh, that's how a resource URL works actually. The next concept to talk about is this idea of the web of resources. So I think in terms of explaining this, I want to go back to my Wikipedia example I was talking about at the start. Um, I mean, we've all, we've all used Wikipedia. We're all used to this concept of I, I'm interested in a subject. I Google that subject. Probably one of the first links that comes up is going to be a Wikipedia article on that subject. And I think we can all relate to the rabbit hole that is Wikipedia. You might go to an article and read some of it and then find a term on that article that you think is interesting. Uh, and then want to know more about that term. And of course, you know, if I'm if I'm looking up, for example, dogs um, as as I don't know as as a random example, um, you know, the the article on dogs. I, I don't know why it would do this, but maybe it's got a, a reference to cats as well. And of course, on Wikipedia, they're not going to include all of the details about cats in the article of, about dogs. Why would they? All they do is they have a link from the article on dogs to the article on cats. And if I want to learn about cats, I click on that second article and I go there and I learn all of the information about cats there. And then maybe from there I can learn about something else. And then I can just keep following that chain until I have wasted an entire afternoon looking at Wikipedia, which is a real thing I think we've all done. Um, the fire is intended to work the exact same way. So if we've got an observation resource, and an observation you'll recall is a resource that we use to model a lab test. Um, observations are typically, they, they have a subject, they're about a patient. So that the observation is an observation on a specific patient. It's worth mentioning, we don't include all of the details about that observation, about the patient inside the observation. The patient's name and their date of birth and their identifiers and all that good stuff doesn't live in the observation resource. Instead, the observation resource has a reference to the patient resource. And by following these links, by following these references, you can construct an entire view of everything you need to know. And this is fundamental to understanding FHIR, is this concept of these references that go from point A to point B. Ultimately, this is the idea, is that health record, I mean, while health, while health record is not Wikipedia, obviously, it's a very different beast, it's intended to work kind of the same way, where it is a web of interconnected information with references that take you from point A to point B. Uh, the way these things look when we see them in the real world is often represented as what are called relative links. So if I've got, and you can see an example on the screen here, I've got a diagnostic report resource and my diagnostic report resource has an ID of 62. Um, that diagnostic report, of course, does not have information about the patient who it's about, nor does it have information about the practitioner who maybe is, wrote the report. What it's got is references, and you'll notice that the way that we represent that here is, is as what we call a relative link. Um, so we've got the resource type, a slash, and then the resource ID, and that's all we've got. And when we represent them that way, what we're actually saying is that the base URL is the same for those resources. It lives on the exact same server, and you could just take the same base URL where you fetched your diagnostic report, 
and substitute the ID of the diagnostic report and, and the resource type for that matter with patient slash 242 and you will be taken to the patient details. And ditto for the practitioner, you can do the exact same thing um, and that's how you construct those things. These are called relative links and I would say in the real world, I mean, I don't, I don't know exactly how often it, the, the links will be relative, but by and large, they tend to be. Um, probably 95% of the, the real world resources I've ever seen use these relative links as the, as the mechanism. That's not the only way to do it though. It is absolutely allowed in FHIR to have fully qualified references and those fully qualified references may point to a different server entirely. And I think kind of speculating, I, I, you know, as I say, uh, it's definitely very common for just relative links to exist and for all of your FHIR data to exist on one FHIR server. But I think as FHIR continues to grow, as people continue to come up with new architectures and new paradigms and new models for using FHIR, I think we're going to start to see more and more, you know, people coming up with distributed architecture where if I've got a system whose purpose is to, you know, to be a lab test system, for example, to, to document lab orders or something like that, uh, there's no reason in that system that I need to, to keep a collect collection of all my patients because I might have a different system that models my patients. So I would just have a reference uh, from all of the data in my lab system to a separate server that keeps all of the information about my patients. Uh, and I, I'm hoping uh, ultimately that we will start to see that because that's a great formula for re reducing duplication. If we just create a web of links between servers, um, we can completely avoid uh, a lot of duplication, which is a good thing. So I think we'll start to see that more as we go. Um, one resource that's worth talking about really quickly is a resource called the bundle resource. Um, I was saying before that all, you know, we, don't, we don't duplicate information. You know, one resource doesn't have information about another resource. Um, the one exception to that is this thing called Bundle, and Bundle is kind of an infrastructure resource that we'll see examples of shortly. Bundle is used for things like search results, uh, and it's effectively a container for other resources. So and in my simple example here, you can see I've got a bundle resource. It has some metadata, just like any other resource, but then it's got a bunch of patient resources in it, in it as well. So this is probably an example of a search result or something like that. I will talk quickly uh, about fire releases. This is kind of a, an interesting subject, actually. Fire the standard, um, the very first ever discussion on, on fire itself, and it wasn't even called fire at that time, was in 2011. Um, so as of, the, as of this time of recording, we're in, in late 2020, so FHIR as of now is, is nine years old, which depending on your perspective is, makes it super old or super young, and I think we could go either way in, uh, in terms of that, but I mean, let's, let's, I, from my perspective, FHIR is a baby, frankly. It has barely been around. Uh, so the first mention ever of, of what was, oh no, what was then called, I believe, uh, Resources for Healthcare. I think that was the original name for it, although I could actually be wrong on that. Um, that was in 2011. By 2014, the name FHIR had been chosen and we had our very, very first release of FHIR. And this, you know, if we were talking about software, we would call this the first beta release. Um, in the world of standards, you don't have beta releases. You have what's called draft standards for trial use or DSTUs. So DSTU-1 um, was released in 2014. Uh, DSTU-1 is a effectively gone at this point. I do know of people that are still using it, but they are very, very few and far between. So DSTU-1 has mo more or less disappeared at this point. The next DSTU, the next sort of beta release of FHIR happened in 2015, uh, and that was FHIR DSTU-2. Um, interestingly, FHIR DSTU-2 um, was, was actually quite widely adopted, and a number of very successful production-grade projects used that, that version of the standard. So especially in the US where there was a lot of early adopting of FHIR. I mean, there are very successful, very, very productive systems that continue to use FHIR DSTU2 today, which is interesting, of course, because there have been several releases of FHIR since. Um, but I, I think this kind of drives home a point that counters a worry that people often have, which is that, you know, if I'm trying to build against a standard and that standard is still uh, still evolving, um, you know, what is, what, isn't that an unsafe thing to do? Like, what if I build against the current version of FHIR and FHIR continues to change? Aren't I going to end up with everything broken? And it's important to sort of stress that, 
you know, you're not required to constantly be upgrading to the latest version of Fire. Uh, and often people don't. There are very successful, as I have said, uh, systems that are using Fire DST2 in production today. And it's working successfully for them. They are achieving real clinical value in, in their systems. I'm sure all of these systems eventually will move to newer versions of Fire, but there's no pressure for them to do that. If it works today, there's no reason to change it. So I do often think that people worry a little bit too much about, about new versions of Fire coming out. But that said, um, there have been several releases since. Uh, Fire R3, uh, and we did, I, I don't want to talk too much about it now, but we did move away from the DST2 terminology to uh, this new R terminology. Um, in 2017, R3 was released, um, and R3 ended up getting very widely adopted uh, among other places in Europe. Uh, certainly that's not the only part of the world that adopted it, but um, I think R3 saw much more European adoption than 2, which was much more USA adoption. Uh, the current release of Fire as of, 20, as of late 2020 is Fire R4. Um, Fire R4 was released in 2018. Uh, and really importantly, um, Fire R4 was actually enshrined as specifically the version of Fire that is mandated for use by several regula regulations in the U.S. And this, as far as I know, is the first time that a national U.S. or a national anywhere in the world, actually, government regulation specified the use of Fire. Um, so th this is kind of an interesting thing. Um, and very interestingly, actually, these regulations do mandate a specific point release of Fire. They say that you have to use Fire 4.0.1. So this is great for the adoption of Fire R4 and also poses some interesting challenges for the future because, of course, once a regulation states that you have to use one version, what do you do about new versions? Uh, the next release of Fire until recently was going to be called Fire R5, um, and there still will be a Fire R5 at some point, but I will say uh, that as of now, the, the plan is somewhat in flux. There is some debate about you know, what the timing should be, what does it mean to release another version of Fire when the current version is enshrined in regulation. Um, and of course, the whole world can't stop developing just because the U.S. has has mandated a specific version. So there are all kinds of competing forces in there. This is not an unsolvable problem. There are people very hard at work in terms of figuring out what to do here. But I will say that the plan for Fire R5 is a little bit in flux. And it is a little bit difficult to guess when R5 is going to get released at this point. So I'm going to speak next about the Fire REST API. Um, now REST API, of course, is a mechanism for exchanging data. Um, REST is actually a very old sort of principle for building APIs uh, on the web. Uh, I don't want to get into the theory of REST here, but it is really, if you're designing APIs, it's a fascinating thing to learn about. And if you just Google REST APIs, you'll probably, as always, be taken to, the, to Wikipedia, which has a great article on REST APIs, actually. Uh, if you want to learn about Fire's REST API, I am going to cover the basics here. And I will say, uh, we could spend hours talking about Fire's REST APIs. They are extensive and incredible and really neat. Uh, the two URLs I've got up on the screen, um, which are fire slash http.html and fire slash search.html, those two links have loads more detail than I'm about to show you here. Uh, so I would highly recommend checking those out and learning a little bit more about, uh, about the Fire standard. Before we get there, though, um, I showed you the resource URLs at the start. Let's put that URL into practice now. So uh, I'm going to walk you through what are called the CRUD operations. And if you're building, uh, I mean, CRUD is an acronym. It stands for Create, Read, Update, Delete. And it's often used in the context of databases and web applications and that type of thing. It's used in the context of data exchange as well. So if you think about the things you might want to do in terms of exchanging data between a phone app and a server in the cloud, for example, a lot of what you're going to do is going to be expressed in the form of CRUD operations. Um, we'll do them in a bit of a weird order for whatever reason. We'll start with the R, which is read. Um, if I want to read a resource, what I'm actually doing uh, as far as HTTP goes is I will issue what's called a get verb. And if I put a URL into my browser, uh, that's just baked into the browser. That's going to do a get verb. And in fact, I could take this exact URL I've got on the screen. I could put it into a browser. And what that will do is do a, an HTTP get, which is what Fire calls a read. And it will download me the contents of, of that resource. That's how that will work. On the other hand, if I want to create resources, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use an HTTP post. 
Uh, and a post is a different verb. Um, I will post that to, once again, my base URL. But in this case, my URL will end with the resource type, as you can see as on the example on the screen. Uh, so there's no idea here. There's no, sorry, there's no ID here. And the server, the, the intent here is the server will create a resource and it will actually reply back with whatever ID it has assigned to that resource. So we're saying to the server, I want you to save this thing, I want you to give it an ID, and I want you to tell me what ID you gave it. Um, the body in this case, and for whenever you're dealing with, with RESTful APIs, you often think in terms of URLs and verbs and often payload bodies. In this case, your payload body is going to be your fire resource. So that's the thing that you will send up to the server. To update a resource, uh, in this case we use a put verb. Uh, and the put verb um, is, is another sort of, it's similar to create. You send it with a payload. But in this case, you will include the ID of the resource. So we will say, you know, I want, I want you to create this resource, or I want you to update this resource with ID 123, uh, and I will use a put. While I'm talking about this, I will mention Fire does have this concept that is perhaps a bit of a niche concept, but it does tend to be really useful, and I know people often go looking for it, so I'll mention it here. Um, if you have a use case where you would like for the server not to assign the ID, you want the client to assign the ID. So let's say I've got a client that already knows the ID that this resource should have, and I want it to go and put that on the, uh, on the server and have the server respect that ID. We can do what's called a client ID assign a client assigned ID create. Uh, and the way we do that actually is, is by using put, uh, just as we did with update. So what that looks like in practice is if I perform an HTTP put and I use a URL that includes an ID, then that actually tells the server that I want you to update that resource if it already exists. But if there's no resource with that ID, I want you to create one and give it that ID. Now servers are not required to, to allow that to happen. A server might reject that, re that request if it does not allow you to do client assigned IDs, but many servers do allow that. So, and certainly our Happy Fire server is an example of that. So that's how you would do, uh, do exactly that. Finally, we've got deletes, um, and the way a delete works is with the delete verb, and once again, you've got a URL that includes the resource ID. Now, it's worth mentioning, uh, in, in the world of health records, you really never destroy data. So the word delete, I think, gives people a little bit of unease. It's worth mentioning here, a delete in Fire is what's called a logical delete. And a logical delete does not mean we destroy the data. It actually just changes a flag on the resource that indicates that that resource has been deleted. Uh, we're not removing the data. And what that actually means in terms of the semantics of Fire is that the resource will no longer appear in search results, and you have to jump through a few hoops to actually find it. But it is still there, it is still discoverable, and if you need to see what it looked like at some point in time or something like that, you can still do that. That's a logical delete. Um, I'm going to shift gears now and talk about the other part of the Fire REST API, which is the search API. So the CRUD operations, I mean, they're all fairly straightforward, creating data and reading it by ID and all of that. But if you're building a, a healthcare application of any real complexity, you're sooner or later for sure going to need to deal with searching. Um, searching is one of the most powerful parts of the entire Fire API. It's one of my favorite parts, actually. Um, it, it is incredibly powerful, and I'm only going to scratch the surface here of how it works. So I will absolutely encourage you to spend some time looking through the, the Fire documentation and learning more about the Fire search spec. But before we get there, let's, uh, let's spend some time talking about how searching works. So the way Fire searching works from an API standpoint is once again, we're going to use the get verb. And we're going to have a URL. Um, and that URL is going to have a type, just like we did for, for our create, for example. But then we're going to have search parameters that come after that. And I will show you how to find those search parameters in a moment. But before we get there, let's just say that we can have, we can have as many of these search parameters as we want. And anything that's a valid search parameter can be tacked on here, uh, including no search parameters. So my very first example at the top is actually a search with no parameters. And what that means is I want you to fetch all patients. Uh, and of course, not every server is going to support that, and it's valid for a server to say, you know, there's privacy reasons I'm not going to allow you to search for all, all patients. But if you've built a, search, a system and you want to allow searching for all patients, then just slash patient is how you would do it. 
And if you want something more specific, you will add those. Um, you might not be able to guess what the search parameters are, but certainly looking at them, you can often tell what's, what's being done here. So when we say patient question mark name equals Smith, I think it's pretty obvious what that URL is going to do. It's going to return a collection of patients with the name Smith. So that's, that's how that works. Uh, and birth date is another example of that. So um, how do we know what search parameters how do we know what search parameters exist on our server? Um, the, the, what I've got on, on here is a screenshot taken from the fire spec. Uh, and if you go to the resource page, the, the definition of any resource in the fire spec. So I go to fire, the fire website, I click on the resources link. I look for the patient resource. I click on the patient resource. If you scroll all the way to the bottom of that resource page, you will always find a section called search parameters. And this is a screenshot from that section on the patient resource. Uh, and this will define all of the search parameters that are valid for the fire resource, or at least are, are defined in the fire specification for the fire resource. Um, as you can see, there's a couple of columns here, and I'll go through them uh, one by one. The first column gives you the name of the search parameter, and the name of the search parameter is the thing that actually appears in the URL. So you'll notice that we've got birth date there as, a, uh, as an example. If the search parameter birth date is, is spelled, you know, all is one word, all in lowercase, uh, and it says birth date, then that's what goes in the URL. Uh, the next, or the column on the right is an expression, and this is kind of an important thing to sort of point out. Uh, the expression is the path within the resource that that search parameter is actually intended to index. Now oftentimes these things are super intuitive and, and sort of one-to-one. -one. So my example up at the top, I've got a search parameter called active, and there is in fact a field in the fire resource called active. It's a Boolean flag, so it can be true, false. So the active search parameter corresponds to a field called patient.active. That's, that's as simple as it could possibly get. But we've also got things like the very last one in this example, like family. Now there's no element in patient called family. There is, however, an element called name, and that name uses that human name data type I showed you before. So it's gonna have a child of its own called called family. So the path to get from the patient resource to family is actually this path of patient.name.family. And the search parameter we gave that is the word family. So that is, there's an example of, of a path being used to define one of these search parameters. Um, a couple of other points about this. Uh, these things are generally one-to-one. -one. Um, you will often, you know, the, the name of the search parameter often co corresponds to the element within the fire resource. They're often exactly the same. But this does not mean that any element in your fire resource can be searched on. There needs to actually be a defined search parameter in order for you to search on that element. Uh, that's the first thing. And then B, the name of the search parameter, while it often corresponds to the element name, there is no requirement that it does. And one of the funny quirks uh, of the fire spec that helps to illustrate that point is the birth date uh, search parameter, which you'll see on the screen right now about two thirds of the way down the, the list. Birth date is spelled with a lowercase d in the, in the search parameter name. Uh, whereas it's got a capital D in the element in the fire resource. And you have to get that correct. If you create a resource, if you're creating a fire resource and you use a lowercase d, you're gonna get an error because there's no element that's spelled that way. It's got a capital D. And if you try and do a search where your URL contains the capital D, you will also get an element because that's the wrong casing for, for the search parameter. So they're not always one and the same. And in fact, technically the search parameter could be a whole other word. It could be date of birth. I mean, in this case it's not, but it could be date of birth it does not need to correspond with the, the name of the element in the fire resource. Uh, I will also mention here that uh, the, the list of search parameters that is illustrated in the fire spec is, it's a suggestion, it's not a hard requirement. Um, a real fire server is not required to implement any or all of these search parameters. Uh, the idea is if you were creating a, if you're creating a server and you're gonna allow a search by date of birth, then certainly the expectation is that you use that search parameter. Like you don't create your own search parameter with a different name. You would, you would, use, date of, you would use birth date. Um, this also serves as a default list. So if you install uh, Happy Fire or Smile CDR, out of the box, you're gonna get all of these search parameters just built in. But 
In the real world, often you're going to want to define your own, and there is absolutely a mechanism for you to create your own search parameters, and that is 100% allowed in the Fire spec. So it's perfectly acceptable for you to define your own search parameters. They might even be indexing extensions that you've added for your own system, and that is totally fine to do. It's also fine for a system to turn off search parameters it doesn't need. And this is commonly done, actually. Um, you know, every search parameter naturally needs indexing. If you've got a database underpinning it, you need database indexes in order to power search parameters. And oftentimes, you can improve your performance if you disable indexes you don't need. So disabling search parameters can be a good thing. If you know that you're never, ever going to search for patients using their address, for example, you might want to turn off all of the various address search parameters that you can see on the screen. And that's going to, if nothing else, at least in, in Happy Fire, that's going to improve your write performance because we do less indexing every time we write a resource. So that is key. Um, finally, we've got this other column here called type. Uh, and this is kind of a, a strange concept. Search parameters have types, um, sometimes called the search parameter data types, although they're, they shouldn't be called that. They're actually just called, uh, called types. Um, and these are not the same thing as the fire data types. They're sort of related. Uh, they have similar names, but they are not the same thing as the fire data types. And they have their own set. There's only a couple of them, actually. And I'm going to go through those types. Uh, the type, give, it tells you about the semantics of how you're going to interact with that particular search parameter. And you'll see in my example on the screen, uh, I've got a token, I've got a bunch of strings, I've got another token, I've got some dates. So all the examples here are strings and tokens and dates. There's only a couple more. There's reference, uh, there's URI, uh, there's one called quantity, there's another one called special, which is kind of a weird catch-all for everything else. Uh, and that's it. There's actually no more than that. So there's not too many of these types, but each one of them has its own semantics in terms of how you interact with it. Um, so let's go through how those things work. First, I'm going to talk about the string, uh, string search parameter type, which I will probably accidentally call the search parameter data type. Um, the, for string types, um, we've got some, some basic semantics here. First off, string, string searches are left matching and case insensitive by default. So if I do a search for name equals AGN, that's going to match my name, Agnew, uh, because we're doing a left match. It's also going to match my name if it's capitalized correctly or if it's all in caps, because that's an, a case insensitive search. Uh, string types, though, do allow for exact matches if that's the, the semantics you want. You do that by add, appending colon exact to the end of the search parameter name. So name colon exact equals Agnew. That's how I get that. Um, the token type uh, is used for searching things which are identifiers or coded. Those are the two common use cases. And you'll recall when I talked about identifiers that they had a system and a value. And for codes, we had a system and a code. Um, the way that we represent those things when we search in Fire is by using tokens. And tokens have the semantics of being the system, a pipe character, and pipe um, you'll recognize as being, at least on a, a US keyboard, that's the little symbol above the backslash key. Um, you will use a, the, the system, a pipe key a character, and then the value. So if I'm looking for an identifier where the system is HTTP colon slash slash foo, and the value is one, two, three, four, then as you can see, I construct a token by putting a, a pipe character between those two. There's some other interesting semantics that are allowable in Fire. Uh, if I want to do a search where I only know the value, but I don't know the system, so I want to match any system, then I just don't include a pipe character, um, and it will just treat the whole string as being only the value. So that's my second example. And it is technically also possible to do a search where I'm looking for uh, any identifier with a given system, and I don't care about the value. And the way we do that is by ending the string with a pipe character. So that means you just treat the whole the whole string as being the system, and it's it's independent of what the value is. So those are some examples of the token search parameter. And I will say there's a bunch of other ways you can use tokens as well, and all of those are illustrated in the Fire spec. So I'm again only scratching the surface of what you can do with any of these data types, any of these types, including the uh, the token one. Dates are interesting, of course. Um, dates searching, I mean, naturally, when you're building health, health data systems, you interact with dates constantly. You're always wanting to do things like find me any lab tests for the last month or find me anything that's happening that's going to happen in the future or whatever it is. 
Um, dates are interesting. So my very first example, when I say date equals 2020, that is treated as an inclusive range. So that's going to match any date that happened anywhere in 2020, from the start to the very end of 2020. I can also use prefixes, and there's a bunch of them. So GT, as you might guess, stands for greater than. There's also GE and LT and LE, and there's actually a bunch of other ones as well. Uh, and as you could probably guess, those, those are used for as comparators. So if I say GT 2020, what I'm actually doing is I'm searching for any date that is greater than 2020. So in other words, anything from January 1st, 2021 and on. Um, I can add more precision if I want. So if I add a month or add a month and a day, then I'm saying I want, now I want anything that happened that day. So from midnight at the start to midnight at the end, that'll create an inclusive range. And of course, I can add prefixes. I can add dates and times to those as well. So my final example is much more precise. I'm now looking for anything that's greater than or equal to, um, to that specific date and that time with that time zone offset. Um, so we can be as imprecise or as precise as we want to. And that's a, a really neat thing about dates. Uh, URIs are, are pretty straightforward. They're, as I say, we use them commonly in Fire, so they, they, there's not, not really much to say there. Uh, the URI type, you just include the URI, and that's that. Uh, and finally, actually almost finally, we've got reference. Um, the reference data type is kind of an interesting one. Really, this is a really common thing to want to do. Uh, you'll have resources that refer to another resource. So for example, I want to find all of the encounters that are for a specific patient. The way that I do that, generally speaking, is by saying, by using the search parameter name, and then my value is that little relative reference. So I'm interested in all encounters for the patient whose ID is patient slash one, two, three. And that's how we do that. Um, it's worth mentioning there is this feature in Fire that I don't want to spend too much time talking about, but you will often encounter it in the real world, so it does need to be mentioned quickly, and it's this concept of chaining. Chaining effectively allows you to construct a search which chains from one resource to another. So in this case, what I'm looking for is, I'm, I'm again looking for encounters, and I'm looking for encounters that are for a specific patient. But instead of looking for, the, pa for the, the patient by ID, I'm looking for it by some search parameter on the patient. And I do that by adding this dot. So the way that you read this kind of complicated looking search is I'm looking for all encounters where the patient has a name of Smith. And again, that name is a search parameter not on the encounter resource, but on the patient resource. So that dot indicates that the next thing is on the target resource. Uh, I hope that made sense. It's a bit of a complicated uh, thing to explain, but I mean, bottom line, that's, uh, that, that, it, it is a bit of an, ex an advanced example, but it's hard to escape when you're building real systems. So it is important to at least know of the existence of these chained search parameters. So I'm almost done here. I'm going to, the final topic I want to talk to in terms of, of overview is this concept of implementation guides. Um, implementation guides are, are neat things. So one of the, the subjects, I, I didn't really point it out much when I was talking about the data model, but you may have noticed it. Um, we have these cardinalities. So fields are, have a cardinality of zero to one or zero to star almost nothing in fire is mandatory. Uh, not nothing. There are things in fire which are absolutely mandatory all the time. Um, an observation status code is an example of that. It is the, the observation.status uh, field has a cardinality of 1.1, which means that no matter what, an observation is not valid unless it has a status. But almost nothing in fire works that way. And in a way, if you think about the global scope of fire, it makes sense. Um, if you think about the patient resource, for example, you might sort of think like, you know, a patient, it doesn't make sense for a patient resource to not have a name because we always, if we don't know anything else about a patient, we must at least have a name. Uh, and, you know, even, even in emergency department systems where someone might show up unconscious and we haven't even had a chance to ask them their name yet, often in the real world, those systems require a name and they'll put something like John Doe there as a placeholder. So. You might sort of ask yourself, like, why would fire not make, make name mandatory? But you need to realize, of course, that there are use cases that use the patient resource that don't, don't or shouldn't capture even name. Fire And fire is intended to cover everything healthcare. So, I mean, let's say we're doing population studies or anonymous studies where we've got de-identified data. We want to, you know, we want to capture that the patient was a male. 
Um, we might even capture their, their date of birth up to the month or something like that, but not include the day and not include their, any of their other demographics. And that's a perfectly valid thing to do. That's a valid use case for Fire. Uh, and in that case, you know, we wouldn't include the name, of course. So Fire would not be able to make name mandatory or it would exclude that use case and many other use cases as well. So Fire is extremely loose as a result. It, it sort of makes very little thing, very few things mandatory. Um, which is great for flexibility, but of course is very difficult in terms of building interoperable software because if you're going to do any kind of real world interoperability, you have to have some expectation that things, you're, you, things are going to be there that are valid for the use cases you're trying to solve. So this is where this concept called implementation guides comes in. Um, implementation guides, uh, you'll often hear them referred to as IGs. So if you're talking to people who've been in, around Fire for a long time, they'll just they'll rattle off this, this concept of Fire IGs. What they're talking about is implementation guides in this context. And a Fire IG, what it actually is, is like a, it is a little mini specification that constrains the Fire spec for some specific use. Um, so what these things tend to look like is, I, I've got a little example on the right here. They, they, they sort of work as these little miniature fire specs. They look similar but not exactly the same to the real fire spec. And they will generally sort of go through, go through a bunch of detail about, about the, whatever the, the, the use case that this thing is for. They're developed using one of a couple of tools. Um, and these tools are all available and they, they can be used for creating your own IGs. Uh, there's a tool, a commercial tool called Simplifier and uh, it's a companion tool called Forge. These are commercial tools. You do need to pay to use them. Um, they're produced by a company named Firely. And they are, there is no doubt about it, they are the, the best tool for this job, in fact. Um, certainly this is a case of if you want to spend some money and get the best possible tool, there's no question that paying for these tools is a great thing to do. They're not the only way to do it, though. There is an open source tool called Trifolia on Fire, which is honestly actually an absolutely excellent tool and has the added bonus of being completely free because it's open source um, and it actually uses Happy as its back end. So I love it for that reason as well. Uh, Trifolia is a really nice tool. Uh, you could find it by Googling Trifolia on Fire and you would certainly find it. And there is finally also this tool called the, uh, the Fire IG Publisher, which is also an open source tool. Uh, it's actually produced by, uh, by HL7 people. Um, and is also a great way of doing this. So there's a couple of these tools that can be used to, to create these implementation guides. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about a couple of examples of, of implementation guides that are out there, just because I think this really helps sort of explain the concept and when these things get created. Uh, the first one is the US Core Implementation Guide. Um, and US Core Implementation Guide is often talked about in the context of this thing called the Argonaut Project. And the naming here is a little bit confusing, so I like to introduce these things together just to help demystify a little bit the naming, um, because it is often used incorrectly, actually, and somewhat confusingly. Um, US Core Implementation Guide is an IG that was developed to allow a base sort of level of interoperability for healthcare in the United States. Um, and the initial use case for the US Core IG was for allowing apps to connect to EMRs, to, collect, to connect to EHRs in the US. Certainly the connection, you know, like phone apps connecting to an EMR is absolutely not the only use case for the US Core IG, but it was one of the initial focuses. And it's a nice sort of starting point for that IG. Uh, the US Core goes into sort of all the basic resources you would want for some base interoperability in the US. The US Core IG um, was, I mean, it, it took a long time to sort of solidify the models. And there was a great big project whose entire aim was to solidify this IG, to sort of nail the data models down and make sure that everybody agreed with them. And that project was called the Argonaut Project. So Argonaut, in the context of Fire IGs, was a project that was created to solidify the US Core IG. Now, somewhat confusingly, people will often refer to Argonaut IG or to the Argonaut APIs or the Argonaut data models. Um, I will say that is not a thing, actually. Um, really, when people say any of those things, what they're talking about is the US Core IG. Um, the Argonaut was just a project to develop it, but it's hard to get away from that terminology. It is very established these days, so 
that is what it is. Uh, I will say, if you're looking for an example of a great IG, um, even if you're not working in the, in, in the United States, uh, the, the US Core IG is excellent. It is incredibly well documented. It checks off all of the boxes in terms of being well modeled, in terms of talking through use cases, in terms of gr having great documentation. So it is, it is a really gold, sort of gold standard for how an IG could be written. So I would absolutely recommend looking at it, even if what you're doing has nothing to do with, uh, with developing apps in the US. Another one that's really interesting, and this is another uh, American IG, but with a, a similar but sort of also somewhat different uh, purpose, is an IG called the Karen IG. Uh, this, this, uh, this IG initially was called the Karen Blue Button um, IG. And the idea with the Karen, Karen Blue Button IG was to create um, Partially, the, this Karen organization are about developing consumer access to health data. So they're all about developing partly trust frameworks and policy directives and RFP language and all this good stuff that would enable people to, uh, to, and to allow consumers to access their own data. But one of the things that they did is define an IG that would sort of create the technical specifications for consumers to access their data. Initially, this was called the Karen Blue Button IG, and you'll often hear people still refer to it as that. Uh, there were some trademark issues with that name, so it's now called, hopefully I'll get this right, the Karen Consumer Directed uh, Data Exchange IG is the long and sort of wordy name for it. Uh, but people will generally just call it the, uh, the, the Karen Blue Button IG still. Karen is a really interesting organization, and I have to say I would highly recommend checking their website out. They are U.S. only these days. Um, SmileCDR is a member, actually, so we are big supporters of their work, uh, and we absolutely hope one day that this concept will come to Canada, where we're based, but as of now, this is a U.S.-based organization. Um, also worth mentioning, uh, another really interesting sort of IG that's out there is is being created by this project called the Gravity Project. I have no idea why that T is capitalized. It shouldn't be. Um, the, the Gravity Project is all about this, this really topical thing these days around incorporation of social determinants of health into health records. Uh, in today's world, of course, we recognize that as much as we, you know, we try to be equitable in everything we do, we absolutely need to rec recognize that there are underprivileged and marginalized communities everywhere you go in the world, and their access to health data often determines, you know, it, it will have a solid determination on what their outcomes are going to be. So, the idea with uh, with with gravity is to come up with with technical mechanisms for us to incorporate these social determinants of health into health data so that we can recognize them, we can track them, and we can hopefully work towards fixing the inequities that exist in our healthcare system. So I, I really, I, I believe very strongly in, uh, in, in the work that these guys are doing, and I think it's just excellent that uh, this is being 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 sort of addressed now naturally coming up with data standards is not going to solve all of the problems in in healthcare we couldn't begin to believe that but by the same token i mean the first thing you often need in terms of coming up with a solution to a project to a problem is at least being able to measure that problem and having things like the gravity project exist is an absolute building block for that first step so that is a great thing um, one final implementation guide, and we're just about at the end now, one final IG I want to draw your attention to is this thing called the IPS, the Inter International Patient Summary. The International Patient Summary is one of the few IGs that is under development these days that is truly international in scope. The aim with the IPS is to come up with a bare minimum health record that could some could sort of constitute a complete snapshot of someone's health that they could take with them as, if they were to move internationally. Um, this is not, of course, by far the only use case for this, but you sort of consider that, I, I often give this example, and, and I love this, that these days, if I were to travel to another country, you know, if I were to get on a plane and fly to Japan, for example, there's a good chance I wouldn't bring any cash with me because I have absolute faith that as soon as I got off the plane in Japan, I would probably within 10 minutes find an ATM and I would put my bank card in and I know that the interoperability will work between the bank in Japan and my bank in Canada and my money will follow me. I'll be able to access my money wherever I go in the world. I just, I have that faith because interoperability is at least in, in this specific context, is so well done by the financial sector. 
I, on the, by the same token, I know in the health sector, we have nothing like that. I know absolutely that if I were to travel to another country and end up in the hospital there, I know full well that they would have no electronic access to my health data. Um, you know, the best they, they could hope for is for me to remember things. If that something was really critical, we might be able to make a phone call or get a fax sent over or something crazy like that. But I know full well there's no interoperability across country borders. And in fact, there are often, even within a country, there's often very little interoperability. I know that here in Canada, there is absolutely no interoperability from one province to the next even. So there, I have no hope that my electronic data will follow me from one province to the next. So IPS is aiming to come up with a minimal data set that could be used to, to bridge that gap, to, to sort of come up with an agreed upon mechanism that data could follow me across international borders. And this is, it's being led mostly in Europe because of course uh, European borders tend to have a lot of travel across them and you know, the health systems in Europe are completely separate between countries. They, they are not at all sort of one single health system. But because you've got people often moving across those borders, having some mechanism for interoperability is important. So that's been taken up. And this is starting to see use in other parts of the world as well, because of course there are many places in the world where people commonly cross international borders. So having this base unit is, is a useful thing. And I, I mean, I will say on a personal note, I absolutely hope one day that this IPS ends up as a basis for, interna for interprovincial interoperability here in Canada, because I could see that absolutely working as a baseline unit for that as well. So that is a, uh, an excellent example of an IG. I am going to end this there. I would like to thank you for listening and following along for the last little over an hour and a half. I hope this has been interesting for you. Thank you very much.